So hello, I'm Denise Hersey from Yale University. If I start to speak really quickly, somebody wave at me because I have a tendency to do that. So uh, I promise to slow down. Um, so I helped head a project we did, which we entitled Understanding the Research Practices of Humanities Doctoral Students. And you may wonder, well, why humanities doctoral students? And there are a couple of reasons we decided to focus on them. One is because uh, the university itself was actually looking at graduate students in general. And not surprisingly, because if you've seen other reports, you know this as well, humanities students uh, in their doctoral programs tend to have a tendency to be the group that actually is less likely to complete their program than the sciences and social sciences. They take longer to complete their program. And of course, as the administration does care, they also cost the most. Uh, to support in their programs. And Yale had actually come out with a report detailing specifics about that within the, the Yale graduate community. So we were aware of that report. Um, another important aspect to this, though, was a study done by Too Cool. So is anybody here from Cornell or Columbia? Or, yeah. So Too Cool is a collaboration between the Cornell and Columbian libraries. And I had seen um, a group of them speak at an assessment, a library assessment conference, in which they detailed a work they had done studying doctoral students in the humanities. So of course, we're librarians and we're willing to share everything, right? So I thought, oh, excellent. This could be really easy. Um, they already have the interview tool and they already have a survey tool and we are a peer institution. We can contribute to the data they've collected. This will be great, no problem. Well, of course, that's not actually the case, but I'll get to that. Uh, and thirdly, we had a new university librarian named Susan Gibbons, and you may have heard her name come up previously. She came from the University of Rochester, and she was actively involved in doing a lot of ethnographic studies with Nancy Fried Foster, the anthropologist who's been mentioned a few times as well. Um, so I thought she would be uh, agreeable to allowing us to do this type of project. So I actually came up with a project plan, and I worked in corporate libraries, so we're really in tune with uh, project management techniques and tools. So I used a project plan that I had learned about um, presented it to Susan, detailing timelines, funding, number of people, um, and she was uh, happy to fund us, which was quite nice. So I got $10,000, which is what I asked for. Um, and that doesn't typically happen. Let me just say we aren't throwing money around <laughs> at Yale. Um, there are actually some new uh, rules about getting money. So fortunately, I, I snuck in. Um, and with that money, I decided to start this project. So I was actually the PI. Um, and my first thought was, well, we're dealing with humanities, so let's involve the librarians who are liaisons to the humanities departments. But before I do that, let me speak to their supervisors. So one thing to keep in mind when you do this project is to really involve all the stakeholders right from the front. So I met with all their supervisors. It was very helpful, um, partially because there were a number of librarians who were already immersed in other projects, and I wasn't aware of that. So being informed of um, Things like that allowed me to make sure that I was including the right people who had the time for this. Uh, we ended up with 11 librarians. Uh, and then we actually met with the deans of the humanities from the graduate school. Um, they were very excited about this project, actually. And they were instrumental in getting us, um, or recruiting for us, the students we needed to, act to interview. So we really didn't have any problem recruiting students, which was wonderful. We did offer them $25, $25 Visa gift cards. Um, that was as much as we were allowed to give out based on tax rules. Um, but you know, they're grad students, they're happy to, that 25 bucks is like gold, so they were happy to help us. Okay. And of course we needed IRB approval. So how many of you have gone through the IRB approval stage, right? Okay. It always sounds good, but somebody has to do the paperwork, right? Um, so one thing to keep in mind, and I was looking at Andrew Asher's toolkit, which I was unaware of. I don't know when it was created, but it's brilliant. I just, you know, I read, I read through it last night and thought, oh, we did all of this. If only I had seen this before I actually started this project. Um, and one of the things he says is it's going to take more time than you think it's going to take, and it does. So I actually did all the IRB paperwork. And again, thank you to Too Cool for giving me some of the information they had and submitted to their IRBs. Um, but our paperwork actually got lost in IRB, so it took three months. <laughs> to get exemption, uh, which was unintended, and I didn't foresee that. So we were off track a bit, but that was okay. So of course we started our interviews in the middle of winter, which was a lot of fun. How many of you come from very large institutions with multiple libraries located all over the place? Yes. So as you can imagine, our 11 librarians were not 
all sitting nicely in this one library and we could all work together and stay warm in the middle of January, you know, sitting together. Uh, so we actually, uh, there was a lot of um, coordination amongst librarians across the campus, which is another thing to consider because it's not always easy to do that. Uh, but before we did that, of the 11, only one of us had ever been in any way involved in any kind of ethnographic project. So following the example of Too Cool and others, uh, we invited Nancy Fried Foster to come train us. Now, remember, this costs money, so you have to consider all of that with your budget. Um, she and I had actually begun working before she came, and we were talking about the interview tools. And this is where things went off track for me, because I thought, oh, great, we've got the tools from, you know, Cornell and Columbia, they're great. And she said, well, you know, they're kind of focusing on how the graduate students use the library. And hearkening back to what you just mentioned, uh, she made it pretty clear that we really needed to think about their work process outside of the library um, without actually biasing their questions. So that meant starting from scratch with our interview tool, which was fine, but it took a bit longer and was a bit more involved than I had expected, but we created a tool and we tested it during the time that she came to visit um, and work with the 11 of us. So we had graduate students who had volunteered to be our guinea pigs and we had digital recorders and we tested our tool and our practiced our interview skills over that time period, which was very, very useful. So the interviews themselves began in January, a bleak January, one of the coldest on records in New England. And if you speak to anyone from New England, every winter is the coldest one on record. Um, but this was clearly the coldest. So we did offer gift cards. The interviews themselves were about one hour long. And we had told students that we wanted to meet with them in a place where they typically worked. So graduate students don't really work in one place. But we wanted to be within an environment in which they did their work. So in some cases, we met with people within the library. In other cases, we were in cafes uh, or coffee shops. Sometimes we went to their apartments. Uh, we went in pairs, in teams of two. One person would, have, would be the actual interviewer, and then the other person would take notes. And another thing to consider, and this is all the nitty gritty stuff you don't think about, was, well, you know, how are we gonna get everybody the digital recorders? We're not gonna buy a digital recorder for every person doing interviews. We're not gonna go out and get 11 digital recorders. How are we gonna make sure people can access the things they need to take with them on the interviews? So we came up with a little kit. It was just a box, basically. Um, it included the recorders, it included extra batteries. It included the gift cards, which I had to go purchase every week for each week's interviews. Don't ask, it had something to do with the fiscal responsibilities of the library. I couldn't just go out and get 33 gift cards. So every week I was at CVS getting gift cards, getting reimbursed. It's those silly little things you don't think about when you look at your project plan. Um, and we actually had uh, the bar, we had the digital recorders barcoded so that when people went out to do the interviews, they checked them out. So on the off chance somebody needed one or forgot to return it, we knew who had it. Um, and we kept it at one of the central libraries. So there were times you had to walk from your library to get the kit, and then over to meet the student. But it worked out OK. Uh, the other thing we did was we decided, well, what do we do now that we have these uh, recorded interviews? Where do you put them? So I'm sure many of you have course management sites of some sort. Uh, we have Sakai, which we call Classes V2. It's an open source uh, course management software. And there are project sites available. So I worked with the manager of that resource, we created a project site, and so um, everyone who did an interview would just upload the interview and then onto our project site. So we, we had them all together, and we had a backup inbox as well. And all of our students were coded so that they were unidentifiable, except to the, the very few of us who were involved. Um, the project site also included a calendar, so we could actually see when the, the interviews were going to take place, who was involved with them. I could go get the appropriate number of gift cards. Um, and we did that for, from January through March, and there were 33 interviews. Um, because we had the deans on our sides, they were actually able to contact students who had completed their program, so we were actually able to interview um, students who had gone through their program successfully to get some information from them, and we had a different uh, interview tool for them, but that was really helpful. And they represented um, 12 different programs of study, as you can see here. And when we were finished, we actually sent our digitized interviews out for transcription. So too cool was pretty clear when I spoke to them. 
um, the members of their group said, do not do this yourself. If you can afford it, please send out these. Don't, don't transcribe yourself. Don't even get students to do it. Just send it out. So we listened to their advice. It really wasn't as much money as one might have thought. Um, we found a company. They did it within a month, and they were pretty affordable. So it was clearly worth it. Um, the next phase was coding. Has, has anyone actually co People here must have coded, right? In an ethnographic state. OK. So of the 11 of us, one person had coded. So we tried to teach ourselves coding. OK, so if you can get someone to teach you this ahead of time, that would be useful. Uh, we watched YouTube videos. We read articles. And our first meeting, we got together, all 11 of us. And I think within half an hour, we realized 11 people cannot code. So we narrowed it down to five people who had volunteered their time to code the 33 different transcripts. And we kind of did this on our own. We came up with this method, which included uh, we usually met about twice a week, and again, this is really time consuming, and I don't think we expected it to be this time consuming. But the five of us would meet twice a week for about an hour and a half each time at different libraries, because we're all across campus. Um, sometimes we Skype in, because really it could take half an hour to walk to somebody's library, and it's just a waste of time. So we would sometimes Skype in to these meetings. Um, we'd all um, arrange to read certain transcripts for each meeting, and one of us would be responsible for actually cutting the transcript up, okay? And yes, there are, there is software out there like NVivo that will do this for you, but we didn't really have the time or the money to, to do it. So somebody would take, be responsible for taking the transcript and actually identifying different topics within the transcripts that were coming up. And then they would actually paste those pieces onto these cards. So by the end, we would get together. We would all have read the transcripts and made notations. Somebody would, have, would come with a stack, sometimes a huge stack if it was a big transcript with all of the cards, you see, color-coded and cut up. And we would sit and go through each card and say, OK, what is this about? Oh, this one's about time management. And we'd put it in that pile. This one's about the hours of the library. And, and the idea was so that we weren't trying to predetermine the categories. We were trying to let the transcripts guide us to what the categories and the topics were that they were talking about. So we had about three filing boxes of these cards with about 30 to 40 different topics by the time we were finished. And it took us three months. Um, and I tried to calculate it. I think it probably took about 50 hours of time for the five people. And that included some evenings where you'd be in front of the television just cutting and pasting. And then finally, we got some students to do that. We'd say, color code. And we'll just have the students you know, paste it for us. And then we'd have um, the cards all are coded with the graduate students' codes. And then we had our just an entire huge table full of these piles of uh, cards. So finally, and I can tell you, by the time you get finished doing that, you are so intimately familiar with these. You don't even need the cards. You could have just talked about the topics right off the top of your head. Um, but at that point, we looked at the cards, we looked at the categories, and we started to organize them. You know, how do they fit together? Are there some large themes? And there were. There were five large themes, which was convenient because there were five of us. So when it came time to writing the report, we each took a theme. Um, and we took our cards. And uh, we kind of outlined on the whiteboard how, how was this going to um, be organized. And then we went off to write. And then, after we wrote it, we actually came up with a list of recommendations. And the recommendations are married to each of the different themes. So I'll show you that at the end briefly. But this, I know today, is more about the methods than our particular study. But I am going to give you some sense of what we did find. Uh, <laughs> one of the first, the first theme of the five themes was identifying research materials. Um, and we talked, you know, there's Wikipedia. We love that quote. If the Wikipedia death thread. Who is not engaged in a Wikipedia death thread moment <laughs> where you started somewhere and you ended up somewhere else? Um, so we, we actually litter our report with lots of quotes, which was great because we had cards of them that we could pick out. Uh, and we just focused, again, on what did we learn from these students about how they identify research materials. Well, not surprisingly, even PhD students start with Google, Google Scholar, and even Amazon. They really like how when they go to Amazon, it'll give them advice as to other books they should read. We're thinking, why doesn't our catalog do that, right? Um, Citation tracking and browsing, we all do that as well. You, you read a book, you look at the chapter, oh, look at all these references, they look great, and you start following the threads that um, arise from that. 
Serendipity, just, you know, you happen to run into somebody at a cafe, they ask about your research, they know somebody else who can help you. A lot of um, meeting people at conferences who turn out to be instrumental in your research. Um, research skills that you already have or learn from your coursework. And then a lot of foreign language skills, which many of them felt they were missing. And this is, this is humanity students, which isn't really surprising. Oftentimes the um, material they need to read are in multiple languages. They're not proficient enough to read those, and especially if they're you know, ancient manuscripts, it, it can be really difficult, and they felt inadequately trained to do that. Um, our second theme that we identified was how they access the materials. So um, one of the things that came up were the hours of, I wanna say the library, but we have multiple libraries, but for the humanities students, there were just really a handful of libraries they typically use. And to a person, they all mentioned the inadequacy of our hours because our hours align with the undergraduate schedules. And when the graduate students are free, that's when the undergraduates are gone, and that's when we're closing at 5 o'clock. So there was a lot of discussion about that. So again, really, um, they were really happy with services like Bar Direct. I know many of you are aware of Bar Direct. It's in document delivery or book delivery service. Lots of complaints about ILL. Um, lots of use of non-traditional formats. They really needed a lot of materials that didn't circulate, so that was an issue, getting access to those. And then what happens when you're working outside of Yale? And these are, again, students who are typically going to be somewhere outside of Yale for, to do some of their research. Sometimes they needed Yale materials, but they, they couldn't get them. If they weren't digitized, they couldn't get them. Even though they were Yale students, they were somewhere else. You know, how can we help them manage that? And of course, being away from Yale also meant they were spending money on travel. So our third theme that we identified were organizing materials. And this was fascinating. And this was brought up yesterday as well. Um, we learned, you know, photograph, photograph, photograph. They go into these special collections, even if they're at Yale. Um, they are, they're spending time, they're spending money, so they just want to get in and out. So they take lots and lots of photographs. If they're allowed, sometimes they're not allowed to, and that's an issue as well. And then they come back with all of these uh, digital files, and they don't know how to actually organize them or use them or uh, tag them. Um, so that was something that I think we found, oh, here's, a, here's a place, immediately we all thought where a library might be able to help them. Uh, many of them were actually organizing these materials in a fashion that was very similar to how they found them in the archival boxes. So they had this sort of um, way of cataloging their own materials in a, in a digital format that was um, very much similar to the box itself, which was very interesting. And then, of course, you know, we identified that um, you know, they have multiple ways of getting materials from archives. Um, they don't like to spend a lot of money there. And unfortunately, a lot of archives do charge a lot of money for scanned materials. Um, they don't know how to organize all the digitizing the materials they come back with. And they tend to, um, they identified a few resources and that they used, like Scrivener, Evernote, Zotero. So I mean, again, this kind of cues us into an, as to what do we need to be familiar with in order to support their needs. Um, so we need to train ourselves in some of these tools if we don't already know how to use them. And then the fourth category was, um, actually, was this, are we in third? I forget. There's their research habits. And this is the procrastination that can take place because for the humanities especially, writing your dissertation can be a really lonely experience. Um, it's not like a lab where you have a big support group working with you, you're off on your own trying to get work done and it's easy to procrastinate or to not understand when I need to stop doing the research and actually start writing. So there was a lot of discussion about how they manage their time. So they have a hard time transitioning from that point where they actually have finished um, uh, their research, and then they need to actually write. And they say, my gosh, you know, I'm writing a book. I've never written a book before, and it can be overwhelming. Um, they actually have to incorporate teaching into their time frame as well, and that can be tricky. Um, and we, we discovered, too, is that the people who seem to succeed most were, in some ways, found someone they should be accountable to for their writing. So many of them just created these partnerships with other um, PhD students, and they would actually get together, and they would say, when we meet, you will have this chapter done. So they had to find ways to make it easier for themselves to be accountable for writing. And then lastly, there was a host of information we um, uncovered on the actual library spaces. And I know we mentioned temperature. 
uh, it has to be a reoccurring theme. I know, depending on where you sit in the library, it could be a sauna or it could be freezing or there are cracked windows uh, or there's no lighting. Um, and many of them preferred to be at home. And I think that came up as well because everything they needed was there. So again, our facilities, um, they want food and drink with them. And in some places they can use, they can do that. And in some places they can't. Why is that? You know, why can't I have a lidded cup with me? I don't understand. Um, the furniture wasn't adequate for them to do their work. Uh, they wanted a spot that was really just for graduate students because the undergraduates apparently get rowdy at night in, in the library. I mean, now I think we need to do a study where we find out what goes on in the library after hours. I don't know. Uh, they wanted better scanners, monitors, printers. I mean, I think we talked about that. They have their laptop, but they really want to hook up to a, a, a big monitors. And that's not really difficult to do. I mean. How hard can that be for us to provide them? And then a lot of them just work from home because everything is there. But again, then they run into that lonely period or this feeling like, well, I just, you know, I can do my work in my pajamas, but now I have this strange kind of, you know, what's my work life? What's my home life? It all kind of blends together. Okay, so those were our results. And I'm just gonna briefly jump into the report itself. It is available online. Uh, we did come up with a Gosh, I want to say at least three pages of recommendations. And a lot of them we've identified as low-hanging fruit, meaning uh, you should be able, there should be things we should be able to fix pretty quickly. Um, another thing we discovered, I should mention we also had a survey. There was an online survey that went to every student we interviewed where we picked up a lot of demographic information, some information on how they use the libraries and what technology they own. Um, so we incorporated that too in the report. Um, but what we discovered, not surprisingly, was that many of the recommendations we made are not specifically things that the library can work on alone. So, so I don't think we're seeing this. Oh, you're not. Yeah, I'm seeing it. The desktop Sorry. Is extended. Well, I can see it. Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> we'll send you a link. Um, but a lot of the recommendations involve um, a brand new teaching and learning center, which we were just developing at Yale. We're a little slow in doing that. Um, the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, uh, and some of it just may be partnering to get funding so that the library can take over um, some of this work, but we can't do it by ourselves. We need some funding. But at least we have some evidence now that we can take to the deans. And we have shared this with the deans. We've shared this with the new um, leader of the Teaching and Learning Center. Um, so we're trying to start looking at the low-hanging fruit and working on some of that. Uh, we, have, we actually have a new um, assistant university librarian for the humanities, so he's kind of taken over using the recommendations to make changes. And I actually have a new job as a clinical librarian, so I'm not involved anymore at all. Um, although we're doing work in the medical library with focus groups and interviews and for other projects. Um, but what I'd like to say is that if you're looking for a project to do, take our tools, go, go use them, contribute data to what we've already you know, started to accumulate. I think we're going to find a lot of similarities, but maybe we can do some more collaborative work. And yes, you probably won't need to change our interview tools too much, I promise. Um, so go out and try something like this. I mean, there's a lot of nitty gritty, but hopefully, you know, you can come back with some information that you can then use to make changes uh, that will involve other pieces of campus. So that's it.